Alors bonjour, mon nom est François Choquette, je suis le député de Drummond et porte-parole adjoint de l'opposition officielle pour l'environnement. Nous sommes maintenant rendus au deuxième panel, soit celui sur l'efficacité énergétique. Nous avons comme conférencier pour ce panel tout d'abord Brent Gilmore de Quest, ensuite Elisabeth A. McDonald de Canadian Energy Efficiency Alliance, ensuite Eleonore McAteer de Tower Renewal, Jacob Irving d'Association canadienne de l'hydroélectricité et aussi Ed Wojcinski du Manitoba Hydro. Thanks. First, they're about integrating conventional energy networks so that energy needs are met with the most efficient manner possible, such as combined heat and power and energy storage. Second, It's about smart land use planning. Recognizing that poor land use decisions waste a lot of energy. Third, it's about harnessing local energy opportunities like sewer heat, biomass, and solar. This is desirable because it improves energy efficiency, it cuts costs, enhances reliability, and it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. For most of us, we really only think about energy in a couple of ways. For some, it's a cold beer and a hot shower. For others, we might only think about it once a month when we see our utility bill, whether it's from Hydro-Quebec or Fortis, BC. But energy, as you've heard this morning, is everywhere and is connected to everything we do in a community. We need it to move water. We need it for transportation. We need it to manufacture. We need it to heat, cool, and power our buildings. But with so much energy available, why do we need smart energy communities? And more importantly, why do we need to be energy efficient? Because we've got a challenge in our communities across Canada. Most of us, about 80% right now, live within an urban area and we're still growing as a population. What does this mean? Our energy demand is still growing up. Canadian communities are the dominant source of domestic energy use, 60% of our domestic energy use, and are the source of over half of our greenhouse gas emissions. Another way to think about this is half of the energy that's used in Canada is used for three things. Space heating, domestic hot water, and industry processing. Smart energy communities can help us address those challenges in urban, rural, and northern and remote communities. At Quest, we've been working to document the top 50 examples of policies, programs, and projects underway, and I encourage you to visit our Smart Energy Atlas to learn more about how Canada is a leader in smart energy communities. I'm going to quickly review six examples of how communities are using energy more efficiently right now. Most of us don't think of a community energy plan as an economic plan or as an innovation roadmap, but it is. There are over 170 communities now that have a plan. That represents about 4% of all municipalities, or 50% of Canada's population. These plans are guiding investment in efficiency, in technologies, in fuels, and are leading to new programs. But most importantly, these community energy plans are establishing a framework for innovation and are essential for allowing all the local players in a community to understand how to work together and to focus on implementation. For instance, the Community Energy Plan in Guelph, the city of Guelph in southern Ontario, led to the establishment of a whole new innovative business model for integrated energy service delivery for wind, solar, and combined heat and power. Using energy locally is a great way to keep energy dollars local as well. Oje Bougamou, First Nations community in northern Quebec, 
continues to successfully take sawdust, as an example, from sawmills operating in the region and turning that industrial waste product into heat, which is then distributed to the entire community for space and domestic wa hot water heating through a district energy system. Another great way to be efficient is to use free energy. My colleague up here this morning might talk a bit more about that as well. Toronto's deep lake water cooling. Toronto's deep lake water cooling captures thermal energy, so the cool energy out of the lake, and uses it for air conditioning in about 40 buildings in downtown Toronto, and the system is growing. Why is that a good thing? It's about roughly 90% better than conventional energy practices, and right now it's added about 40 to 60 megawatts back into Ontario's electrical grid. Another good example of free energy at the City of Vancouver's Southeast Falls Creek Neighbourhood Energy Utility. Here, this system has recovered sewer heat and uses it to heat about 70% of the space and domestic hot water needs of the local residents in the former Olympic Village. Not wasting energy is not only just good business, it's also good for the environment. In Markham, Ontario, the use of waste heat recovery from four different natural gas-fired combined heat and power systems is meeting about 60% of peak heating demand in winter. So that's a nice way of saying that of these four systems that are operating, they're capturing the waste heat that would just be put into the air and they're actually using it to meet the heating needs of that community at the same time. It's a good idea. But it's not just public utilities that are leading the way so are private developers. In Quebec City, La Ville Verte uh, is a mixed-use development that is using a biomass fuel district heating system for heating, but they're also trying to make sure that the stormwater management that they're undertaking is reducing energy use associated with wastewater treatment. Little fact for you, depending on where you are in Canada, for a municipality per se, their electricity budget might about 40 to 60 percent just go to the treating and pumping of water. So let me say that again. Up to or thereabouts 40 to 60 percent, depending where you are in Canada, for just for a municipality, for its electricity bill, is dedicated to the treating and pumping of water. That's huge. The federal government has a direct opportunity to accelerate the development of smart energy communities in Canada. What's needed is an update and a revision of the Integrated Community Energy Solutions Roadmap. This report was developed in 2009 and was endorsed by the Energy Mines and Ministers Council. I'm by the Council of Federation, and it sets out what needs to happen right now. There also needs to be support for utilities, gas, electric, thermal, to implement smart energy communities and more importantly, to focus on smart energy networks and to innovate. How utilities operate is rapidly changing across Canada. They're not only distributors of energy, they're becoming producers of energy as well. And they're also starting to develop their own technology. But there is little to absolutely no research and development support directed to utility innovation. Third. There also needs to be sustained support for northern and remote communities to become smart energy communities. They need our help. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing all of you at our eighth conference and trade show, Quest 2014, in Vancouver from December 1st to 3rd, to get smart energy communities accelerated across Canada. Merci beaucoup, M. Gilmore. Nous allons, euh, et puis merci de nous avoir invités aussi à votre huitième, euh, au huitième, euh, à la huitième conférence. Euh, nous allons maintenant passer avec à Mme Elisabeth McDonald, qui est la présidente de l'Alliance de l'efficacité énergétique du Canada. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Chaquette and others who've been responsible for organizing this event. It is a real pleasure. It's nice not to just talk about renewable energy, but also energy efficiency. Let's talk about the whole ball of wax and not part of it. So well done. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to speak to you about a few things today. I'm going to talk to you about opinion polls we did on energy efficiency because rumor has it there may be an election in the next year and so let's find out what Canadians want. And I'm going to talk to you about the value proposition for energy efficiency so that those of you who don't think there's sex in rock and roll, there is. Um, so SIA is the country's leading independent advocate promoting the economic and environmental benefits of energy efficiency. We work, we work with federal and provincial governments where needed and stakeholders to ensure energy efficiency is a priority for all sectors of the economy. So who are we? We have large multinational co corporations, we have utilities, we have a wide variety of groups involved in energy efficiency. Yesterday I was in Halifax talking to, um, at a business forum with Efficiency Nova Scotia, there were 300 business people there. The Canadian Construction Association, Electrofed, HREI, those are the people who do your air conditioning um, and all of those other things in your basement that only when they break down are they a problem the mechanical contractors of Canada, the insulation companies. We represent at least 25,000 light -like member industry members and when we meet with our friends in the uh, Canadian Home Builders Association from across the country, we go over a million. Yes, we are larger than the oil sector in terms of jobs. C is proud to advance a strong voice for energy efficiency. So before you all go energy efficiencies, um, let me talk to you about an integrated energy plan because last year in October, the International Energy Agency released its first report focused on energy efficiency in the marketplace. And it noted that energy efficiency has been called a hidden fuel, yet it is hiding in plain sight. Indeed, the degree of global investment in energy efficiency and the resulting energy savings are so massive that they beg, beg the following question. Is energy efficiency not just a hidden fuel, but the world's first fuel? So all I'm saying is if we're going to have an integrated en energy uh, plan in Canada, then energy efficiency has to be the first fuel, the one you don't use. So when I took over at SIA, I found out that there were a few things missing. And the first thing is, what do Canadians think about energy efficiency? So in 2013, we commissioned the Gandalf Group to do some research. We found out that more than half of Canadians, 58%, said they are doing some things to conserve em energy, but they will likely could do more. So all of you put your blue box out on Wednesday, you were doing something. Just over a third of Canadians said they've done a great deal to conserve energy in the last year. Those are the uh, strong conservers and they tend to be leaders. They're the people who adopt and uh, renewable energy sooner. It's a sort of hard one third. When asked the benefits of conserving energy, 86% of Canadians right now said it's about saving money, 49% said it's about helping the environment. So on, t on Wednesday, and I've just come back from vacation, and yes, I have a cold, I don't have quite this horse of voice, um, I sat down and watched um, a panel at Advertising Week, and they had three Canadians, and they were talking about new planning for advertising. Why am I talking about this? because 86% of Canadians are talking about saving money. The speech from the throne told us this year that we're supposed to be concerned about consumers. So if you want to get to the heart of what Canadians want, then energy efficiency has to be part of it. Because what I learned is with the 11,000, 1,100 or 11 million images that are shot at us every day, the ones that make, addition, make a difference are the ones that speak to the heart that right now you have to speak to the heart and right now Canadians are worried about their economy. So remember that, that's why I was listening to it in advertising week. And maybe my son was on the panel. Um, however, environmental concerns be, are motivating, but they're not the sole part of it. And so don't confuse yourself right now. Canadians in 2010 were more concerned environmental issues. Right now, they're more concerned about saving money. We learned that one third of Canadians said they haven't done more to conserve em energy because of uh, conserve energy because of cost. Only a quarter of Canadians have had an energy audit done. Did you know you could have an energy audit? If you live here in Ottawa, phone Hydro Ottawa, they'll help you do it. 
Few Canadians are able to reduce their reliance on the car despite the obvious benefits that they see. That speaks to the transportation issue. 81% of Canadians said that developing technologies that reduce energy consumption is important. So I'll tell you that about Canadians and then let's find out what they do when they go to work. Uh, we commissioned what seems to be the first poll on energy efficiency at the Canadian businesses. It took us a long time to actually design the instrument. It was a snapshot of a range of companies in the business community examining the extent to which Canadian businesses understand how energy efficiency investments can control and reduce costs over time. What did we learn? Energy costs are concerned for most Canadian companies. So they're worried about their energy costs at home and they take that to work. This is the case in every industrial sector survey. Concern is especially high among larger companies and those that consume gasoline, diesel, and propane in addition to electricity because energy efficiency is not just about electricity. In fact, for most of you, energy is not just about electricity. Sometimes we talk so much about electricity, we forget how large the topic is, unless you're talking about the oil sands. In the smaller companies are less concerned as many of those rent, but compared to those who own their properties. While most in the real estate and services sector, excluding retail and hospitality, are concerned about energy costs, they are less concerned than others. Most, 61%, have seen their energy costs increase in the last year. So that's a significant number. The majority of companies want to make improvement when it comes to energy efficiency. 73% of the businesses sampled said energy efficiency was a high priority, and 76 of builders and architects shared their views. The motivation to do so is higher among those with a higher concern about energy costs. That's kind of observing the obvious. Companies perceive cost savings or greater efficiency in operations or production as the most important benefit to them from undertaking energy efficiency measures. So again, pocketbook issues. That's what Canadians are concerned about. Is there a value proposition for energy efficiency? It provides dividends to consumers through reduced energy costs and paybacks over and above capital costs. It can delay or reduce capital replacement costs for some equipments and buildings. I just came back from Italy. They're doing work on the Uffizi Gallery. A lot of it has to do with better energy efficiency because that's a big concern in the EU. And let me tell you, they're not replacing the Uffizi Gallery. So if they can do that in Florence, we can do that here in Canada. It improves buildings, home comfort, and our health. Oh, from the period of 20, uh, 2002 to 2012 period, energy efficiency of improvements across Canada increased GDP about 1% or $16 billion per year and added roughly 2.5% to the overall level of employment. I used to be in the film and television world. I used to come up here and talk to people about tax credits. I used to talk about jobs that you, kids, you want your kids to have. Well, now this is where I think we want our kids to have jobs because this is going to grow. Not that they shouldn't be in the film and TV world, but there's another opportunity for them. When energy users upgrade their windows or add insulation to their homes or replace outdated equipment in their factories, this creates demand, which in turn generates economic growth and creates jobs. Energy efficiency spending and investment saves Canadian consumers and businesses energy and puts money back into their pockets. And that is simpler, similar to a reduction in the federal sales uh, goods and services tax. So what role do we play? First of all, I'm here talking to you about these numbers to say Canadians care. Canadians want this, and so that's an important message. We also have to support initiatives, and we're looking for legacy initiatives. We're not looking for initiatives that can come in one year and go the next year. So we're, looking, we're working with some of our members on tax proposals and sustainable mechanisms that as I commented on the film and television world, we'll be here 10 and 15 years later. That makes a difference. We're having an advocacy day here on Parliament Hill on November 18th. What are our key messages going to be? Energy efficiency has to be part of an integrated energy policy in Canada. If it's the first fuel, then have us as part of the integrated energy policy. The other thing which may seem small but is important is to maintain and renew, renew the Natural Resources Canada's Office of Energy Efficiency. Like many programs, it's up for renewal and you may not think it's a big deal, but let me tell you, if that gets moved around through government, then we've got a problem. Those people do an excellent job. They're the conductor of a symphony called energy efficiency. 
They do the building codes, the provinces adopt the building codes, all of those things help me. We need the conductor, so let's make sure that's renewed. And we want energy efficiency to be part of all party, party platforms for an October 2015th election. If it's earlier, we still want it to be part of your agenda. So we really look forward to that. Um, I just want to remind you that the Office of Energy Efficiency plays an important role. And so when I say it's in conductor, it uh, provides the tools, codes, and standards. It's really important. And finally, we will be promoting the, the, the case for the hidden fuel, the first fuel, and um, so we want to be on the mind of each and every Canadian. Thank you. Alors, merci beaucoup, Madame McDonald. Et puis, euh, je suis euh, totalement content de vous avoir euh, invité. Et en plus, euh, je suis d'accord avec vous qu'il faut intégrer euh, l'efficacité énergétique à une politique sur l'énergie. C'est vraiment essentiel pour avoir une bonne politique énergétique du Canada. Alors, nous allons passer à notre prochaine panéliste, qui est Madame Eleonore McAteer, qui est directrice du programme Tower Renewal de la Ville de Toronto. Elle est responsable de développer le programme qui vise, entre autres, à améliorer l'efficience énergétique des édifices. Alors, je vous cède la parole. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's uh, quite unique for, for uh, my experience from working at the City of Toronto to come all the way up here to Ottawa to speak to uh, people on a, a national level. So it's a, it's a great treat for me to be here and hear all of you, and, and I'm happy to share what we're doing in Toronto, a little bit of what we're doing in Toronto. My focus is on our existing buildings and communities. In urban centers like Toronto, where I work, buildings are the source of greatest energy use. Brent mentioned community energy planning, and a big focus of Toronto's energy plan is building energy efficiency. Looking at our cities, it's clear that in the future, most of the buildings we will have, we already have. It isn't practical to replace them. Creating the best new buildings that we can, it's a worthwhile goal, but even when we succeed at doing this, as a community, we will barely make an impact or an, on overall energy efficiency performance. So real performance improvement means figuring out how to mass market energy retrofits. In Toronto, we have a lot of apartment buildings from the 1960s and 70s. In fact, we have 1,200 of them. They're like those uh, buildings that are pictured in the, the top corner. They're located throughout Toronto in all neighborhoods, and that's what's shown at the bottom picture is an outline of Toronto, and all the little white dots are where the apartment buildings are. These buildings are structurally very sound. They can last for hundreds of years. They've got lots of good, strong concrete in them. But they come from a time before building codes had energy, any energy performance requirements. So I'm working with the buildings in Toronto, but we also know that there are many, many buildings like this throughout the country in many, <coughs> many urban centers. With little insulation, aging windows, walls, and equipment, energy use in the buildings is very high. It's much higher than it needs to be. Studies and test sites have shown that along with much better environmental performance in water use and waste diversion, energy use can readily be decreased by 50%. Retrofitting these 1,200 buildings could result in Toronto's greenhouse gas emissions being reduced by 5%. The most important reason for having these buildings perform well is so because they are, need to be good homes to people. In Toronto, over 550,000 people live in these apartment buildings. They're a very important source of our affordable housing. They're a very important source of housing for newcomers. Toronto's economy has, in the past and in the future, will depend on being a good arrival city having these being good, strong, affordable housing in the years to come will be a success factor for Toronto. It's important to know that the people who live there like living there. 
surveys have found that tenants generally view their apartment communities as safe places to live they overwhelmingly consider their neighborhoods to be good places to raise children so we need these buildings because People want to live there and need these as good, affordable housing. Retrofitting these buildings will secure an affordable housing source for decades to come. In Toronto, we've identified the apartment buildings as a focus for supporting improvements, and we call that the Tower Renewal Program. It's a program where we're trying to achieve a wide range of improvements to the buildings and the communities around the buildings hitting on all of the areas of sustainability. The technology, technology to achieve better performance exists. It's well proven. In the picture here of the building, that's a picture showing energy loss coming out of the building. The high energy loss areas are the bright areas, the yellow areas. Retrofits can make a huge difference in building performance. For instance, adding insulated cladding and windows to the exterior, as shown on the cross section on the other side. Better heating systems and lighting, low flow fixtures, and renewable energy are all in use in apartment buildings in the city. I have many cases uh, where all kinds of different retrofits have taken place but it's very, very rare to find it all in one building at one time. High efficiency heating and air handling systems, including building automation and monitoring and renewable energy generation, such as solar walls and photovoltaics, all exist. There is no technological barrier to achieving very high energy efficiency performance in these buildings. If the retrofits needed to bring the buildings up to high performance levels were done on a wide scale, there are tremendous economic benefits. Buildings are here, so the work has to be done here. It has to be done locally. A range of skills are needed in the areas of design and specification services, manufacturing products, and on-site installations. This work keeps money circulating locally. Our studies have shown that over 30,000 person years of employment would be generated and over 2 billion in net wages would be paid locally. So why isn't it business as usual? All of these retrofits save on energy. They save on operating costs. Eventually, the amount of money that's saved will pay for the retrofits but the key word is eventually. The capital, the intensity of the capital needed to do the retrofits just doesn't fit into existing business models. There's no sense of urgency about getting these buildings retrofitted. A mentality of, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. So the buildings limp along as they are. When something breaks, it's fixed as a one-off, and often fixed with the lowest cost way of doing so. So what is needed to get the improvements? One thing is innovative financing, a way to be able to source that capital that currently is just too difficult to do with existing building models. We have in the city a current pilot program that allows us to loan out um, funding for retrofits that is then collected as part of a property tax surcharge. But it has very limited funding, so we would need much higher uh, capital investment to be able to do all of the buildings. There's also regulations, such as tax treatments on retrofits. If they had similar kind of uh, preferential tax treatment the way that um, generation projects might have, that would be very helpful. There are other regulations, such as building codes, that are still problematic in being able to apply certain energy efficiency measures, such as occupancy sensor lighting. And frankly, the industry has to get better at convincing people that what they have to offer really works. 
these are big investments and are viewed as being very risky so if people are going to make the investment they want to be sure that it's going to work and right now they just aren't resident engage mint is also a big part the buildings the way the buildings perform depends a lot on the people who live there and the more that we get better at engaging people in taking a, a stand in a, in a, a an interest in their energy performance, the better off the buildings will be. So all of the outcomes are linked, the social, economic, and environmental. One relies on the other. Having a well-designed and operating building will save on energy, be comfortable, provide better quality of life for residents, and be more affordable in the long run and it will support local businesses and industries. And we know really that all that I've said about apartment buildings with modifications can apply to any building type. Collectively, the deep retrofits will result in overall benefits in a big way. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame McAteer. C'est vraiment très intéressant et je, je pense effectivement que les trois piliers de, du développement durable que vous avez nommés à la fin, l'économie, l'environnement et la société, sont indissociables quand on a une approche euh, non, non seulement de développement durable, mais aussi dans l'esprit euh, euh, de l'efficacité énergétique. On va passer maintenant à une, la thématique plus de l'hydroélectricité. Alors, nous avons avec nous euh, M. Euh, Jacob Irving, euh, qui, euh, qui est un représentant de l'Association canadienne de l'hydroélectricité. M. Irving compte plus de dix années d'expérience comme gestionnaire d'associations et spécialiste des relations gouvernementales. Nous avons aussi euh, M. Wojcinski qui est gestionnaire de division, gestion des projets de portefeuille chez Manitoba Hydro. Il est également membre du comité consultatif sur les espèces en péril du gouvernement fédéral et membre de l'Association internationale de l'hydroélectricité. Alors, je vous cède la parole. pour nous avoir invité aujourd'hui à participer à, la, à cette forum. And uh, thanks to all of you for taking some time of your schedule to come and have this very important conversation with all of us. Um, again, my name is Jacob Irving. I represent uh, Canadian hydropower developers from coast to coast to coast. And as many of you may know, uh, not only are we the largest source of clean renewable um, energy and electricity in Canada, we are also Canada's single largest source of electricity, which I think is something that this country uh, is, is, is justly proud of. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about energy efficiency today uh, from a bit of a different angle, I think. Uh, we're going to talk about it from um, a generation point of view. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about electric vehicles a little bit later as well. And my colleague Ed Wojcinski is actually going to talk about it, I think, from a, a synergy perspective, from a partnership perspective, how uh, wind and water in particular can work and how it is working in a very real way um, in the middle of our continent on both sides of our, the borders. So. I think we actually have a lot of uh, good news, exciting things to discuss here over the next few minutes on this panel. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to uh, clean and renewable electricity, um, we in hydropower, you know, I, I sometimes say uh, we're, we're your, your grandma's original clean renewable, we're your great grandma's clean original renewable, we're your great great grandmother's clean and renewable electricity. We've been around for over 130 years, and uh, we have a very strong past. We have a uh, strong install capacity, and we also have a very strong future, which I think I can probably demonstrate with the next chart here somewhat, just to help put a bit of context into things. I always enjoy looking at this slide, taking a step back and taking a look at the world and taking a look at how we compare to the world, also to our nearest neighbor and biggest trading partner, and then uh, ourselves. You can see that uh, the way the world makes electricity is still largely thermal based. You can see, and coal is still number one with uh, natural gas um, in a close second, and it being the majority. And then you look at how our friends in the United States make their electricity, and you can see that they're actually pretty close to the world average. And then you flip to Canada, and you can see that we are an outlier. 
sixty one percent of our electricity is from hydro power that helps make our electricity system one of the cleanest and most renewable in the world and i think it's important to mention this because i think it demonstrates that there is opportunity there's opportunity in the sense we have a lot of installed hydro power capacity from coast to coast to coast but then you look at our neighbors to the south and our largest source of electricity export obviously is to the united states we make about three hundred and seventy terawatt hours of hydro power per year and we send the United States about 40 of those terawatt hours. Um, so obviously we use hydropower mostly for our own domestic needs, but we've also had a growing ability to send it down to the United States. And every one of those terawatt hours we send the Americans obviously helps displace some of their um, less clean generation that they have. Um, and actually it often raises eyebrows when I speak to American audiences, but you know, as much hydropower as we send to the US, we represent less than 1% of their annual electricity consumption. So clearly there's a huge room to grow. And um, I mean, I often say, you know, if we dreamed big and we attained 2% of US electricity consumption, it would mean a big deal to them in terms of reduced greenhouse gases, but in Canada, it would also mean a doubling of our current exports. So it's good to every so often take a step back and have a look at the hydropower, not just for Canada, but also for the United States. We're also in this in this field. We are the third largest uh, hydropower generator in the world, and it's something to take a, a moment to think about. The largest hydropower generator in the world is China, with a population of about 1.3 billion people. Number two is Brazil, with about 203 million people. Number four is the United States, with about 320 million people. Canada, we're number three, with 35 million people. So we clearly box above our weight class when it comes to developing and producing clean, renewable hydropower. And if we quickly switch to the next slide, I think, uh, I like to think this is uh, some good news. You can see that, uh, again, we have strong installed capacity. This bar to the right says, you know, it shows we have 74,000 megawatts of installed capacity. That's what we currently have in Canada. The green, large green bar atop it shows our undeveloped technical potential and displays that we could more than double our current installed capacity. So we have a lot of clean renewable hydropower left to develop. Uh, 25,000 in the middle, that represents the number of megawatts we're currently working on across Canada. So we're currently building about 25,000 megawatts from coast to coast to coast. And um, and interestingly enough, I mean, what, what does that represent? Over the next 20 years, that could mean about $127 billion in investment and about a million new jobs. And, I th and if you go to the next slide, it's important to remember that, that this development is uh, of a clean, renewable character. And the, when you look at this particular slide, it was developed by the Pemina Institute for a Manitoba Hydro Project recently, it clearly demonstrates that, that Canadian hydropower uh, greenhouse gas emissions are about as close to zero as you can get. And our ability to develop those um, is, is very strong and our ability to complement other clean renewables such as wind and others is, is equally strong. Um, one of our major characteristics is that um, we offer storage. We are the only clean renewable to offer storage capacity. And we uh, are able to lend that to make other forms of clean renewables more efficient, including wind power. So I think with that, it's an opportunity for me to uh, turn things over to my colleague, Ed Wyszynski, who will actually be able to, to talk to you about an individual project where wind and water are working together toward producing um, clean renewable electricity more efficiently. Sorry, thanks, Ed. You've heard, You've heard there's lots of hydro. You've heard that it produces virtually no greenhouse gases, but is hydro clean aside from the greenhouse gases? You heard from Michelle Letelier this morning, and I'd like to briefly expand with one overhead on that. Hydro can be bad in terms of environmental and socially, or it can be good, depends how you do it, and Michelle said that. Uh, 40 years ago, a lot of the projects that were done 30 years ago were not done in what we would today consider acceptable. 
we have redesigned our projects right across Canada, every utility. We have changed how we uh, work with the local people, um, and we do benefit sharing with local people, particularly the Aboriginal people, and we no longer go and uh, develop a project and then almost as an afterthought deal with uh, the local people. Now we work with them for years, if not a decade ahead of time, and particularly with the Indigenous people, we enter into partnership arrangements or other forms of benefit sharing, and the objective is that they feel that the, the project in their midst, they're better off with than without, and that they are, um, that they want the project. And in, the, and in, in many cases, and I'm used to talking about my company mainly here, uh, but others across Canada are doing it, like Energix, you just heard, the uh, local communities are partners in the project. An example is the Squadron Project, 1.6 billion that uh, just finished construction a year ago, 33% owned uh, by the local First Nations. Um, they were uh, co-developers of it, and working with them, what we did it, up until 2000, this is a 350 megawatt project, we redesigned it to a 200 megawatt project, virtually eliminated the flooding, we increased the per unit cost, we internalized the externalities. Uh, next. So um, we're talking we're talking about efficiency. One aspect of efficiency is we are making other renewables more efficient and making uh, them more economically feasible. Uh, there is no single magic bullet, silver bullet, that is going to solve the whole carbon and clean energy picture. We need a portfolio of options, starting with efficiency on the consumer end, but then looking at the supply side with a range of, of options and having technique technologies partner with each other. This is uh, from a study where um, done by MISO, which is an independent uh, operating agency, uh, which looked, uh, this is a US-based one, the whole Midwest of the US and Canada, and they analyzed uh, what a, a number of years down the road with the, the, about the 10,000 megawatts of wind they have in the Midwest. We already in Manitoba are acting as a battery to store uh, wind when there's lots and then when there's uh, a deficit to, in, to make up for it and supplement, acting as a backup or a storage, and this shows uh, uh, on a minute-by-minute minute basis uh, what would happen with realistic wind profiles from the Midwest and uh, operating, we're in a competitive wholesale market, we all respond to price signals and as the wind increases uh, we decrease our hydro and vice versa. And what they calculated in, th in that year was $430 million of savings in the electrical system by having that backstopping as compared to not having it. And uh, so that, that's an indication of how we can work together with wind, with solar, to improve uh, the economics and, and achieve better environmental benefits. Next overhead. This is an example where we have in the, uh, in the Minneapolis, Duluth area, the iron mines, uh, the large city of Minneapolis, a very large load center. Uh, secondly, uh, in the west, in the Dakotas, uh, you saw earlier the high penetration of uh, wind in that area. Uh, that wind is coming into those load centers, and we already are acting as a battery to help support that. Um, we're increasing that. Uh, thirdly, there's a brand new project that we just got approval earlier this year, a, a $6 billion project, <laughs> building transmission into that uh, U.S. area, and we're supplying uh, on-peak base load. We're also acting as the battery for thousands of megawatts of wind and making it feasible. So uh, a partner in that project, by the way, is... Uh, um, done in conjunction with four Cree nations who are 25, up to 25% partners. So we see partnering between the various renewable technologies uh, as a, a very positive way to make it the whole uh, renewable and clean energy more possible and fa happen faster. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour euh, vos euh, pour euh, vos, euh, vos commentaires, vos, votre présentation, M. Jacob Irving et Ed Wojcinski, euh, sur la présentation pour l'hydroélectricité. Euh, nous avons euh, maintenant un, à peu près une demi-heure là pour euh, discuter, interroger nos panélistes euh, et commenter sur euh, l'efficacité énergétique. Euh, juste avant de poursuivre, je voulais juste mentionner que moi-même, j'ai euh, déposé en tant que projet de loi privé un projet de loi sur euh, l'efficacité énergétique euh, pour améliorer euh, le, ce que fait le gouvernement fédéral autant pour l'efficacité énergétique des maisons, euh, des, euh, loge des logements, des, euh, euh, des industries et euh, des commerces et euh, 
Donc, pour le moment, ça n'a pas été accepté, mais ce n'est que partie remise parce que je pense qu'effectivement, l'efficacité énergétique doit faire partie d'un plan et de, sur un, un plan national sur l'énergie. Et on a bien vu qu'avec l'hydroélectricité aussi, on peut jumeler cela avec l'éolien, par exemple, et ça fait un excellent ménage. Alors, je vous cède la parole. On va commencer avec le micro ici à ma droite, 62. On va continuer avec le 51. Alors, je vous demande de vous, euh, vous nommer, nommer qui vous êtes et euh, votre titre et d'y aller avec des commentaires assez brefs, euh, s'il vous plaît, et euh, par la suite, euh, d'y aller avec une question si c'est nécessaire. Donc, merci. Will Davidsky, uh, ancien employé du gouvernement fédéral dans le domaine de développement durable. Uh, on a parlé de l'efficacité de l'énergie dans les villes et le potentiel uh, en termes de réduire la consommation, mais il y a une autre alternative aussi, ça vient de uh, les micro-réseaux uh, d'énergie propre. C'est une tendance lourde dans plusieurs parties du monde. Uh, Californie a un programme de 450 millions à peu près pour une période de cinq ans pour encourager les, les gens qui sont des propriétaires des résidences, aussi bien que les entreprises, à développer leur propre microgrid, soit bâtisse en isolation ou comme groupe de, de bâtisse. Euh, alors, j'aimerais que tu commentes de cette façon de réduire la consommation aussi bien que euh, des mesures pour réduire la consommation en soi-même. Et euh, je vais ajouter que avec euh, l'Allemagne et la Chine investissent aussi bien dans le emmagasinage de l'énergie euh, et c'est un modèle qu'on voit plus en plus partout dans le monde. Et dans le cas, juste ajouter une chose, dans le cas de l'Allemagne, 50 de l'énergie renouvelable provient des coopératifs, des individuels euh, et des fermiers. Alors, on a oublié tout ce, disons, aspect pour réduire notre consommation, à la même temps libérer l'énergie électrique où on a un surplus en plusieurs provinces pour des autres fins, parce que le transport, au moins au Québec, représente 42 de gaz de fait de serre. Alors, peut-être qu'il y a quelque part, nos priorités ne sont pas les bonnes. Merci. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm sure that uh, Quest has some good answers to that, but we have to be careful because we co-mingle our responses sometimes. So we just talked about California, we talked about China, and we talked about Germany. Um, energy in Canada is a very complicated subject. Um, there is a federal role, and then every province and territory plays a role in it. So when you say this is what they do in California, then you really have to talk about this is what they do in Ontario, BC, Saskatchewan, or whatever. And for some reason, the Americans can have a more coordinated conversation about it, even though they have 50 states. We have you know, 12 or 13 conversations, depending on the day. And so that makes it a much more challenging. So I just want to say that before you say anything about communities, because it really is a challenge. And, and the other thing is when you look at Germany, China, and California, our attitudes towards energy in this country are much different. Do you know that we use more hot water per capita than any other country in the world? I have two sons. When they were living at home, I thought they used it all. But it turns out everybody's son is, everybody's mother is, everybody's doing it. We have, in our own view, a surplus of energy, and as much as people are pushing back on the costs, our costs are so much lower. So we don't, when we go into a room, or when we leave a room, have a way to make sure that we don't use the electricity. I'm sure I'm listening here to the city of Toronto, and I'm sure that apartment buildings is my younger son's. And we just have, and I'm sure he's got his air conditioning on and his windows open. 
Uh, so we have an attitudinal change before we go to policymakers and before we talk about it. We've got to start putting a price on this. It's not a price on carbon discussion, a price and a power instead of just going and saying we have an issue. And we have to realize we're different. Our costs are still way lower than anyone else in the world. And so while when there's an election in Ontario, people talk about it, or when there's an election someplace else, we don't have a national conversation on this. And until we have a national conversation, then we're not going to be able to have the, sol the solutions. It's a great question. Canada is doing actually a lot to advance, if you like the term, microgrids. The language that is often referred to across Canada, and you can look this up, is smart energy networks. Now, why do they refer to that? It's thinking about all three ways of energy, electricity, as we think about it through gas or pipes, and thermal as well. So when we think about energy, we have to think about all three at the end of the day. So where is it happening? Who's doing what? So a good example for those who are curious and want to see how it's rolling out now across Canada, I'll point you to Ontario, point you to a community uh, called the City of Markham, and I'll point you to a company called PowerStream, that's their utility, and GE Canada. And they have launched the first, I'd say, commercially scale size uh, smart energy network. And what that's doing is doing the following. It's figuring out how to take energy that might come from combined heat and power. It's understanding how energy might come from wind, from solar, how to link that to storage, how to time that when you have off-peak, when you have high-peak in this terms of uh, full demand, how to go back and forth and understand how to distribute that. The energy world is complex, but what's happening is the technology is catching up to help people in their own community understand how to harness their local sources. You'll also see examples uh, playing out right now in British Columbia as well, and it's going very, very well. So a key thing here, uh, just to emphasize from the federal role, is that the opportunity for smart energy networks was a well thought through and researched direction of Natural Resources Canada that is not getting a lot of support. So as you heard about the importance of reinvesting in the Office of Energy Efficiency, don't forget about the importance of CanNet Energy, who's also doing a lot of great work to understand how to take us and keep us uh, at the international scale of investment that's happening now in the same area. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Gilmour. Et nous allons passer maintenant au micro 51, à ma, le micro de ce côté-ci. For in, in developing into provincial uh, hydro grids more widely, there's been a lot of talk about potential federal leadership role in that area. My understanding used to be it was very difficult to ship power over long distances without losing a lot of it. But is, is the technology changing on that to, to make it more feasible? Two questions. Two questions in there. First of all, technology. A higher voltage reduces the losses. Uh, HVDC technology, which is increasingly used, the, uh, the line from the, the north to southern Manitoba, which is, goes almost 2,000 kilometers, uh, 1,600, is HVDC. And, it, uh, so it, it, uh, and that is technology which is continually improving. Secondly, ability to uh, transmit across the borders east-west. Right now, very definitely, the transmission grid is strongly integrated more north-south than it is east-west in Canada and the U.S. And there are incremental improvements happening right now. For instance, in Manitoba, we're working with, with SAS Power, got a 500 megawatt MOU, and we'll be in all likelihood having some uh, transfers to them so they can help shut down some of their coal. Uh, but uh, there are incremental steps. and. It, uh, to have something more major needed that would be a cross-Canadian grid, that's probably something that would have to require some federal involvement because it's probably not going to happen uh, very quickly uh, just through the incremental. Merci beaucoup. On va juste éteindre le micro ici à ma gauche. Pesez sur le bouton. Merci. Et uh, on va laisser uh, la parole maintenant au micro à ma droite. Vous nommez, s'il vous plaît, nommez votre titre. Merci beaucoup. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mikhailo Oleksienko. I'm an intern at the Parliamentary Hill, and at the same time, I represent a group of research and development scientists from Ukraine that is interested in how can solutions 
for sustainable development and renewable energy introduced to the Parliament of Canada and companies involved in this sector. Are there any specific strategies that are already involved are going to be or either going to be introduced in the nearest future? Thank you. Merci pour la question. Est-ce que quelqu'un parmi vous qui voudrait euh, prendre la parole? Oui, oui, allez-y. Survey. There is one interesting one, perhaps, that I know that's been recently unveiled. It's uh, through Electric Mobility Canada and its uh, charging stations along the Trans-Canada Highway that would allow electric vehicles to drive coast to coast um, with uh, reduced range anxiety and the ability to charge. And I mentioned that in the context of energy efficiency because obviously um, hydropower and other renewables are very excited about supporting that type of advancement. Because when you think about it, an electric motor runs at about a 90% efficiency rate. An internal combustion engine runs at about a 25% efficiency rate. So when you want to talk about efficiencies, there's huge gains there. I, I often joke that I think that uh, when my children get older, that they'll ask me, they'll say, you know, Dad, is it true that when you were young, the people used to burn oil in cars? 90% efficiency rate, that's the kind of thing we want to target with our already 97% efficiency hydro. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect marriage. There's another uh, development that I would encourage you to look at through SDTC, Sustainable Development Technology Canada. Uh, they are now testing on four different continents the same technology, and it's a modular uh, approach to producing power, heat uh, as well, that can use any type of fuel coming in uh, to it, particularly, let's say it's biomass from a local community. Uh, it's designed to be modular, meaning you could just build a module just for uh, power. You could add a module on for thermal. You can add a module on for storage. Uh, it is based on, uh, in this case, military deployment. So container ready is how it's described. And it's first being used in Canada's very north to understand the harsh climates and Saudi Arabia and desert and in certain other areas. And it's being picked up very quickly for up to 10 megawatts of localized power generation at a very affordable rate. The, um, uh, as part of the um, G20 or G19 now, I'm not sure. Um, the, when they met in May, the energy ministers met and they made a commitment um, because of some of the crises happening in um, Eastern Europe to the development of uh, cooperation and uh, technologies in the areas of particularly energy efficiency, better uses of sustainable energy. And uh, it's quite evident now when you talk to people from Foreign Affairs and from Natural Resources Canada, this is a key area. And I think this, that we, if we can work together, bring the, um, the engineers and the developers into that, that there can be a great exchange. And I think you're obviously coming from the right part of the world where Canadians really want to help and work with you. Merci beaucoup, Madame McDonald. Um, Monsieur uh, Gilmore et Monsieur aussi Irving, qui ont tous pris la parole. Uh, je voudrais continuer avec... Uh, My on there? I'm uh, Jeff Smith, I'm with the Canadian Electricity Association, and I just first quickly wanted to echo a comment made by both Elizabeth and uh, Brent about the programming that's going to be up for renewal at Natural Resources Canada in the next uh, budget cycle, uh, specifically the Office of Energy Efficiency and uh, the CanMet programming. Um, for major utilities across the country, what the OEE does in terms of leadership uh, provides our utilities with platforms and infrastructure that they can then adapt uh, for programming in their specific customer areas, provinces and whatnot. So it's very vital in terms of the big picture of energy efficiency. So I hope for those in the parliamentary side of things that you may look into that and, and ideally it's something that all parties can support. Um, my second, my question, uh, perhaps a little off topic in terms of maybe it's more appropriate to the last panel, but I wanted to ask uh, Jake and or both of our friends from the Hydropower Association uh, the, the potential for hydro in Alberta, obviously from the mo most of this morning we hear that uh, that's an area in terms of electricity specifically where we have a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, some work to do if we want to look on the environmental side. What are the barriers? We've got a sense of the opportunities, but can you talk a little bit about the Alberta hydro potential and what, uh, what, it, what, the, what it looks like in terms of going forward? 
Uh, sure, thanks for the question. I don't know if we can get the chart back up there, but in the map that I showed earlier, it showed where we're at in terms of development and undeveloped potential. One of the interesting things about that map is it demonstrates that um, Alberta has an extremely large undeveloped hydropower potential. In fact, it has the fourth largest undeveloped hydropower potential in Canada. And when you step back and take a think about it, I mean, for, for hydro, what do you need? You need water and elevation change. And that province has water and elevation change. Um, of course, the trick is, is that over their, their history, they've turned to coal uh, for, for producing their electricity. And sometimes we almost suffer from a bit of, of a stereotype because hydro really hasn't been built a lot yet. There's a feeling that there must not be any potential. And of course, nothing could be further than the truth. There's huge potential in the province. And um, again, marrying it up with the other huge renewable potential, wind and solar. I mean, Alberta has some of the best wind corridors in the country. It's the sunniest province in Canada, and it has huge undeveloped hydropower potential. So I think some of the barriers are sometimes um, uh, for private investment. Uh, some of the renewables can be a little bit difficult in terms of upfront capital investment and, and, and return on investment. But the lesson that the rest of Canada demonstrates is that um, if you invest in hydro um, in the long run, it's the best choice you can make in terms of affordability, um, reliability, and uh, also in terms of uh, greenhouse gases and um, air pollution. So Alberta has nothing but options and uh, I think it's, we're, we have an exciting opportunity to see that get stitched together, I think, with the right leadership. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Irving. On va continuer avec uh, le monsieur ici à, à ma droite. Oui, c'est correct, yes. vous pouvez y aller. Merci. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Adler. I'm a consultant with uh, ICF Canada. Uh, my question is directed to the first three speakers, and uh, our company's probably done more energy efficiency studies than anyone in the country uh, over the last 25, 30 years. And we know that even today, there continues to be uh, billions of dollar, millions of dollars of uh, cost-effective energy efficiency potential in the country. Um, aside from what the utilities are doing in terms of investments and the government, federal and provincial, th there remains the question of how to mobilize private capital. We know today that uh, there are billions and billions of dollars of private capital in Canada sitting on the sidelines. And we also know that uh, with a few exceptions, the financial community, Class A banks and others, are largely not offering dedicated instruments in support of energy efficiency. So my question to you three is, uh, what is the single most important policy solution to help mobilize private capital to get in behind this vast uh, energy, cost-effective energy efficiency potential in Canada? Well, um, I had mentioned that we have a new financing option that is uh, the city loans out money for energy retrofits and then we collect um, payments on the property taxes. But we have uh, in the city only limited amounts of capital to be able to do that program. Um, we're doing things like building subways and spending hundreds of billions of dollars in, in other infrastructure. Um, so what we have proposed is a way that the city can act as an intermediary, but it would require some provincial regulatory changes to allow the city to be able to do that. And these are similar to the PACE type of, of uh, arrangements that take place in, in the United States. Um, there has to be, and we have the pilot now, and uh, we have had some, it's only just started in the, this year, uh, we are having some very good response to it, but I think once we establish that that demand is there, um, then it will be easier to uh, make the case that we should be uh, more uh, involved in this marketplace. Well, <clears throat> then you get into complicated discussion. Are we talking about the provinces? Or are we talking about the federal government? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the first complication you have on that. And where the real demand is, is another one. I've just been involved in a great discussion, Ontario non-bill financing. And 
you know, whether the need given the, uh, given the cost of financing right now is there or not is another question. But you know, I presented you with some information about knowledge. And let me tell you, when you look at Canadian businesses, regardless of who's leading this, if you don't, if we have not figured out a way to make the CFO the champion of energy efficiency in companies across this country, they won't invest. And we haven't done that. This is the most disjointed conversation that we can come to. We're going to talk about it in silos, and then we get into the provincial silos and municipal silos, who's interested in what. We have to get together, and there's very little underneath that commitment by the federal government in it. Um, the Office of Energy Efficiency and CAMMET do a fantastic job, but we really need to get out there, first and foremost, and sell what you're saying. Sell that to people. Really, we all maybe know it, or many people here know it, but most of the CFOs don't know it. If we can go in and prove to them that they can save money, then they will go to their banks, and they will be able to get the that money that you say is sitting on the sidelines, because it will create jobs, because it will do that sort of thing. But we don't have the CFOs on side. We don't make a business discussion. We wait until people come and say, will you do this work for us? And we don't have that kind of bank. In the US, they're doing, in cities like Boston and Seattle and other places, they are doing labeling inside of buildings. You can walk in, you can see what happens if you live there or if you work there. Those sort of things are needed, you need, but you need central. We stop to start changing the story and making the case. I don't know if that's a policy change, but it's a communications change. If we communicate it, then the policies will follow. Simple reality, we have low cost energy. And when you see correctly energy priced, people start to invest. And so what we haven't talked about is you still need to consider from a federal perspective then if you're looking for the policy direction is what's the cost of carbon. If you want to start to see and drive investment, then you have to think about it from an economic perspective in the marketplace and what would drive investment. We are starting to see though is that there is lots of equity that is starting to be put into project development. Maybe not for energy efficiency retrofit development on the scale that we would like to see it, but when you have private developers now coming to build their own systems, what they've come to realize, and this is a different story, is that it also makes sense to own the energy system because it can give you a return on investment. And so what's happened is that some CFOs have woken up, not all of them, that they can make a return. And that how you structure that actually requires that the province uh, change some of its regulatory rules to allow for a bit more innovation. But when you come to a federal role, it might also just making sure that there's no restrictions on that kind of investment coming in that might be both uh, international or national if you want to see that kind of movement. And so that's where we need to start looking at a bit more closely. Merci à vous trois pour uh, vos réponses. On va aller maintenant au micro ici, au monsieur. Bonjour, mon nom est Réjean Provo de Transfert Environnement et Société. Je m'occupe de la stratégie de développement de la Um I'll switch to English, so that's uh, easier for everyone. Uh, I'd like to share and also suggest a few things from what I've been hearing this morning. Uh, a lot uh, goes around communication and education. And I think one thing that um, uh, our generation is not using enough is social media. We need to reach out there to a uh, younger generation. Uh, they're the one that are going to be the advocate of change. And I, I'd just like to share uh, a specific example. We're involved in a project in the West Island of Montreal with regards to the reduction of garbage, domestic garbage. And the way we've done it is we've done it through high school, middle school, uh, elementary school, and social media. And we've introduced the gamification by street so that there is contest uh, between each street in, in the city uh, to reduce their uh, garbage. Well, after two weeks, and it's not been long, there's already 49% of reduction in the garbage and in the incremental and, and, uh, and recycling and composting. So my recommendation would be to really uh, understand uh, that the advocate of change are uh, much younger than we are all here, and obviously they're all using social media, and they're not in traditional media, they're not listening to radio, they don't care about polls, and, and it's time that we switch our minds and thinking about what's going to make the difference. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Oui, votre point est très apprécié. On va continuer avec euh, le monsieur à ma gauche. 
Allez-y. Hi. Uh, Tom Cullen, Citizens Climate Lobby, a volunteer. Um, and one of the obvious things seems to be that, the, again, to use Mishka's uh, comment about the elephant in the room, if we had a price on carbon, and uh, it's been mentioned already, then obviously all of these things like energy efficiency would, would rise to the top as they are the, the least cost solution. Um, given the current political climate, uh, we're talking to our MPPs, uh, I come from Toronto, um, about the possibility with the wind majority government in, uh, in Ontario of a provincial uh, price on carbon uh, in Ontario. Anybody have some ideas about how to make that more saleable? I think likely with your um, Minister of Energy, Shirelli, and um, Minister Murray, who's taking over climate change, they'll be very aggressive about it. You're in a good position because th there is a majority government. That's far easier for them to manage. I believe they're talking to the province of Quebec jointly on it. So, yes, I, I mean, I think you're in a good situation um, in Ontario. Um, the rest of the country, you know, gets... It's that choppy, choppy energy conversation. <laughs> like, if I had the answer, I'd be, you know, it, it'd be like understanding peace and stuff. <laughs> I, I, I think I might have an answer, a partial answer. Um, you know, Ed was talking a little bit earlier about how hydropower, uh, over the course of its history, you know, there, there has been such a thing in the past as bad hydropower. And um, we work toward making good and better hydropower nowadays. And what's that, what that has meant has been internalizing externalities. There are things associated with the way we make our electricity that we didn't know we had to pay for, that we just didn't pay for in the past. And today we do. And what does it mean? It means that new hydropower is more expensive than, than past hydropower. Now, what would, what would redress that? Some recognition for the benefit that we bring and that in the form of a healthy carbon price or a cap and trade system, what have you, a carbon management system that would help redirect investment toward clean renewables, such as hydro and wind, I think can then be seen as an opportunity. Ontario has a lot of installed hydropower capacity. In fact, that was the original form of electricity generation for the province. Um, and it has a lot of undeveloped potential as well. If there was better recognition for the existing and future merits of hydropower, I think you'd see some of that unlocked. And so it's, it's actually an opportunity and not necessarily a, a negative um, or a drag on, uh, on the way we make electricity. A, a totally different answer. Uh, you've got Quebec, which is already working with California. You've got BC that has a carbon tax of a form. You've got a quasi thing in Alberta, which is very quasi, but Prentice has made some positive noises in that area. Um, Saskatchewan knows it's going to have to do something. They just put in the carbon sequestration plant. If the federal government is enacting, how about the provinces getting together? Now, if there, uh, maybe there's an opportunity if, if the provinces can jointly do something that becomes more politically pal pal uh, acceptable within the province. I think the, uh, Ed just made the point that was critical is that some days you don't have to have an exact policy at a federal level, but you do need to have a leadership role. And that is a critical role for having to give a potential direction, if nothing else, to at least encourage it on a regular basis. And I think there, those undertones are, exist in all provinces. You asked about what's happening in Ontario, what could spur it further. The reality is the energy system, that community in Ontario has already done its shadow pricing, meaning it's already ready for it. There's not this magic button that has to be pushed to refigure it all out. It's been there the whole time. Most of the world, actually in the industry world here in Canada, has got that to a point in some capacity. It's had to figure it out. We're just kind of waiting for someone to stand up and say, let's do it, because everyone's got it on their books, and they're just waiting for it. Not everyone, but for the most part. And I think this is where we need to kind of get back to that conversation, that it's okay. It's okay for the Canadian economy. We've understood what the impacts are going to be. Or we continue that conversation, but let's get it to that point. Merci beaucoup. Donc, on va aller avec maintenant notre dernier intervenant, le monsieur à ma droite. Bonjour, mon nom est Vincent Dufresne. Uh, I'm a master degree student in sustainable energy policy at Carleton University. 
And uh, my question has to do uh, with the interplay between hydroelectricity and energy efficiency. I, and knowing that uh, the large crown corporation, Manitoba Hydro, Hydro-Québec, and BC Hydro uh, are leader in hydroelectricity generation, but are also leader in delivering uh, demand side management programs. So I would like to know if an increased capacity or an increased ability to export hydroelectricity to the United States, in your opinion, and I'm speaking to the two last speakers, Mr. Herving and I apologize, Ed, uh, I, <laughs> Mr. W, all right, Mr. W. Um, I, I'd like to know if uh, through increased capacity and the ability of selling, exporting more electricity to the United States, we would line up business uh, interest in, uh, and, and re rejuvenate the interest of Hydro-Quebec, BC Hydro, and, and uh, Manitoba Hydro in, in that specific case in delivering uh, more energy conservation program. I, I can answer for Manitoba Hydro, but I know that generally this is uh, there's a lot of there's a trend across the country. Um, we, as a company, just this year decided to quadruple, uh, four times more uh, DSM or demand side management uh, than we have been doing, and we've already been doing a fair bit. Um, and that's been done in conjunction. With, uh, I had a little map there where we were putting in a new transmission line into the United States, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Um, one of the things, it's, that line is bigger than the new generation we're putting on. And one of the things we're counting on is with the in di increased DSM to f the energy that's freed up, we're going to be counting on exporting it to the U.S. and then using it to reduce greenhouse gases and everything else in the state. So actually we're going to be exporting both DSM and new hydro to the U.S. The, through that facility. and. Uh, uh, we see that as being a very positive uh, feature, and as a matter of fact, uh, we just finished a two-year huge regulatory process to demonstrate whether or not our project and exports were justified, and something called Green Action Center, which is a Manitoba environmental uh, coalition, supported that for the reason I just said. And, and perhaps generally, I think um, in a lot of the Crown utilities that you find, um, it's interesting because, you know, they are owned by the people of the province, essentially, through their government. And so uh, when you want to build a new hydro facility, and usually hydro facilities, when they come on, they come on big. Um, and, and sometimes the way they put it, they come on lumpy. For a while, you won't see any hydropower development because you can get the, the, the advantage of it, and then another big project comes along. And I think generally what you find with uh, our members is, is when they want to go forward and make the case for building a new large hydro project, um, they really have to win um, uh, the, the social license, and I think also the economic social license from the, from the people of their province, who will usually challenge them first and foremost to say, well, because they are interested in affordability and reliability first and foremost. They want to see, well, what have you done to demonstrate that you've got demand side management under control? What have you done to demonstrate that we really actually need this new project? And that's uh, the, the heart and the essence of, of a lot of the justification behind hydro. So there's a really strong link there that I think um, guides the way we develop today. And, it's, uh, and I think it's positive and it's, and it's, uh, and it's moving us forward. Uh, just, a, just a point to build uh, on both the last two comments is that uh, what's happening is we're seeing the fact that DSM is just good economics, but it's also uh, good for business. On the other side, as we've heard, is you're getting uh, into new uh, business areas or environments. Uh, CEA, the comment there's a representative here from today, they have their vision for 2050. And one of the key ones is electric vehicles. And one thing that we're starting to see is a much better interplay between production and then distribution and new market opportunity in terms of the economy. Where do you start to put this electricity? If it's not going to go all down south, where else can you put it? And this is starting a whole new conversation about how do you build out the uh, highway infrastructure for EVs, right? It's just part of this conversation. You see it being driven in BC, Quebec um, as well, uh, and a little bit more so now in Manitoba too, although there's also the climate conditions on how well we can use EVs in cold climates. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je, merci à vous. Je, je vois qu'il y a deux intervenants. Je vais fermer les lignes ici, donc ça va être les deux derniers intervenants. Euh, rapidement, je vais vous laisser euh, commenter un, un après l'autre. 
et euh, par la suite, euh, on va peut-être conclure et euh, aller euh, euh, pour le dîner, parce qu'il hein, y a des gens qui commencent à avoir faim. <rire> Alors, rapidement, des, cours, des courtes interventions. On va commencer avec vous, madame, et ensuite avec vous, monsieur, deux courtes interventions, s'il vous plaît. Uh, I'm Frances Devereaux with Climate Fast. Uh, I just haven't heard anything mentioned about nuclear energy, and I'm particularly interested in. Uh, I personally, I wrote a brief claiming, I don't know if it was 100% true or not, but I believe that it's not 100% greenhouse gas free if you look at cradle to grave from mining through building, through decommissioning, through refining uranium. There's a lot of greenhouse gases in nuclear energy. So to me, I think replacing it uh, in Ontario with water power from Quebec would be really positive. Um, I'd just be appreciating a comment. And I'm s driving my car until that uh, electric uh, charging system exists across the country so I can switch to an electric vehicle. Well, interestingly enough, my question actually was similar, is, is that um, several organizations have been promoting very heavily for a number of years the prospect of, um, and it goes to one of the graphs Mr. W put, put up there, about the load balancing of, of hydro capability with, with wind uh, and the notion that uh, if there was high capacity transmission lines between Ontario and Quebec, um, the, the increased wind in Ontario might actually be able to use some uh, c reservoir capability in the Quebec side in, the, in their hydro to help load balancing across the two. Can I have a comment about both technical as well as uh, other policy impediments to that? Uh, technically, there is no difficulty doing that. You just need enough transmission, although Quebec and uh, Ontario are obviously pretty close. Uh, it does, uh, there is a, uh, we're, uh, all the utilities are operating in a wholesale competitive market, though. Uh, and uh, so when you use your reservoir for one purpose, you can't use it for another purpose, and there's a cost. So uh, I, I, I don't know the particulars of what's going on between Quebec and Ontario, but it's certainly uh, um, a possibility. And in fact, actually, I think uh, the, the example that Ed provided earlier about how Manitoba is making it work with uh, three U.S. states, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota, how they're making wind and water work together is an example that it's entirely possible. And you think about it, it's I often, I, Ed's modest about it, but I, I, I'm, I'm always excited about it because I think, you know, that example is not just a great example of clean renewables um, uh, helping each other, uh, but it's also a great example of international cooperation. Uh, there's any number of things, when you get a, a province in three states pulling together to make their two different forms of clean and renewable energy work together, there's a million different things that could derail such a complicated um, uh, arrangement. And it's happening. Uh, so I think, you know, it's a strong example to um, province to province throughout the country as well. It's, uh, it's not rocket science. It makes great sense. And as I often say, when you marry wind and water together, it's the best combination since peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> and we've got lots in this country. So. Um, the one thing I'll remind you of, I hate to do this, but Ontario has somewhere between 75 and 83 uh, local electrical utilities. Um, so when you start talking about Ontario, everybody assumes that you've got BC Hydro and Quebec Hydro and SAS Power and Manitoba Hydro. And then you come to Ontario. So it's very <laughs> complicated. And it's not going to happen in the same way because that single entity isn't there to have the discussion with and make those things happen. And it's a huge frustration when you're dealing with Ontario on one hand, and that there are so many complicated um, issues per utility, per, per, per regional uh, municipality that's involved. So um, I just warn you that what appears logical in your head may not fit into the, um, the actual structures that are there. Bien, alors j'aimerais remercier les panélistes Brent Gilmore, Elizabeth A. McDonald, Eleanor McKeeter et Jacob Irving et Ed Wojcinski. Alors on peut les applaudir, s'il vous plaît.
auparavant de reprendre un autre panel. Bien sûr, on 